My story begins when I was 16 years old, sitting at our dinner, sitting at the table during our family dinner. My dad's at the head of the table. I'm sitting next to him. My sister Carl is across from me. All of a sudden, in a totally panic mode, she starts describing the spiders that are crawling all over her face. Get them off! Get them off, she says to me. I look at her and I'm horrified. My heart is breaking for her. My sister was 12 years old and she was experiencing her first man. I went off to college, and of course, I'm going to be a pharmacist just like my father, because what I'm going to do is follow in his, fam in his footsteps. Okay, cool. But I quickly switched to pre-med, because saving my sister was so much more important than following my dad's footsteps and doing the legacy of the family business. I entered my residency in psychiatry, and of course, I, our inpatient rotation is at a hospital that it only allows homeless people with no insurance to get in. It was one of those end of the road kind of places, okay? Major mental illness everywhere. I, 15 patients, first rotation, I am totally overwhelmed. I couldn't handle it, it was way too much. The party line in our therapy, in our, our residency program, was everybody goes into therapy in their second year during their outpatient rotation. Well, people, I lasted a month. I shot myself into therapy, and within three months, I was going five times a week. Remember, I'm in Boston, like the analytics mecca, okay? <clears throat> Finished my residency, and I became the... I became a psychiatrist for the trauma center, and I kept going to therapy five times a week. Oh, I can tell you. So in walks Sue. She's 25 years old. She's just suffered the fifth or sixth chronic hospitalization, in and out, suicide attempt, cutting, the usual. She was a typical client for the trauma center. However, when I meet her, she looks like somebody who just comes out of a Martha Stewart magazine. She's got this like embroidered sweater. She's got these thick ribbed corduroy slacks, pearls, pearl earrings, pearl necklace, and those duck shoes that everybody from New England seems to wear. Yeah. They get them from L.L. Bean, like the mothership. <laughs> Excuse me. If you haven't noticed my talking. shirt, I'm a gay man, okay? <laughs> and I do have that stereotypic fashion gene that those gay men have. So I'm looking at her and I'm like, this outfit doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> but whatever. I don't say anything, okay? <laughs> so Sue starts talking and starts telling me the details of her hospitalization. She's pretty bright. She's articulate, she's pretty self-aware. But all of a sudden, she starts complaining. She starts complaining about the inpatient staff. Oh my God, these people know nothing. They don't know anything about how to treat trauma survivors. Then she complains about the head psychiatrist. And she tells me her outpatient therapist knows nothing about DID. Instead of taking this as a red flag, <laughs> don't laugh at me. <laughs> <laughs> it totally activates my rescuer, my caretaking part, and I am hooked. Sue's, Sue and I are on a journey. I become her outpatient psychiatrist, therapist, and I'm thinking to myself, suffering, duck shoes, DID, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Sue and I spent the next 20 years together. And she did become vulnerable. And she was able to tell me about the horrific details of her trauma history. Being tied up, witnessing the abuse of animals, her own sexual abuse, even witnessing a murder. I thought it was odd because all this happened while she was a child at the babysitter, four hours a week, three times a day. Three times a week, four hours a day. But I wasn't a truth seeker. I was here to help her with her overwhelming experiences. And she did get better. 
no more hospitalizations, no more cutting, no more ODing. She actually went to grad school. She graduated. She became a physical therapist. She married a guy who she met on the inpatient unit. She even had a child. She was getting better and I was feeling good. I think this is time to call it a day. <laughs> However, this is the kind of stuff Rich loves. <laughs> Things started going south with Sue and I. She started complaining about me and telling me about the uselessness of her therapy. She dreaded coming to the office every week. Her young parts were terrified of me. At one point she comes in and she's like, oh my God, Frank, my life is great, except when I come in to see you. So I'm thinking, then why are you coming? Do us both a favor, let's call it a day, we're done. But that's not what I say, right? I sit and take it because she comes from this waspy family and I'm going to tolerate her feelings. That's what I do. Next, she says, I'm going to start journaling. I'm like, okay, great. Because I need a way to express my feelings. And it's not working here. So she goes to the library three times a week, writes copious notes, comes into session, and starts reading them to me. Oh my God, people, this was not <laughs> riveting material. <laughs> Let me tell you, I work so hard to look interested and care. <laughs> Thank God that phase only lasted a couple weeks. Next, she comes in with this booklet, this little handmade booklet with all these crayon drawings on them. I'm like, okay. She hands them to me and she says, here's a book me and my consultant made. I said crayons <laughs> and I said consultant. What consultant? Unbeknownst to me, she goes out and gets a consultant. Unbeknownst to her, the consultant was a friend and a colleague of mine. Thank God. So I'm reading through this book. I'm looking at all these pictures. Like, what's going on? Okay, fine. All of a sudden, she look, gets enraged with me, and she says, shut the fuck up, Frank. Boom. I am like plastered against my seat. I couldn't move. I wanted to say, you shut the fuck up. Get out. But I didn't. I took it. I stayed. Okay, and <clears throat> I didn't really know kind of what to do in this moment. I said, Sue, and I mustered up a voice, thank God. I'm like, this is what therapy's all about, working through difficulties. This is what we do. We're going to be closer, okay? But the reality is, people, you know, you don't spend 20 years with somebody without loving them and being fond of them. I loved her. And I was aware that she was working her butt off to try to fix something that was broken. I knew that. I was a victim of her perpetrator parts over and over again, right? And she was feeling like a victim of me. The blessing and the curse in all of this is that Sue abruptly stopped treatment and I haven't heard from her or seen her since. Now, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was going on here, honestly. And, in fact, this storytelling event and being Simonized by Rich and his <laughs> editor parts have helped me. <laughs> what I really real believe thing. happened is that Sue and her younger attachment parts became psychotic towards me. That, in fact, the intimacy that her and I shared over those 20 years was too much for her younger part. I also believe that my trauma history got in the way. I spent a lot of time and a lot of hours sitting with crazy growing up. It was kind of normal for me. It's what I knew. And I believe I sat there and I took it. And if you don't name something, you can't work with it. I, I believe I sat with Sue's crazy much too long. I don't think it helped her, and I don't think it helped me. But what I do know is that I have been able to relearn 
that lesson that I learned in the beginning of my residency, sitting with people in intolerable pain. But at this level, I kind of am learning it in a different way. After going through these 20 years with Sue and sitting with psychosis and healing my own trauma around being with crazy. And I have to tell you, it feels like I'm looking at the world for the first time with new lenses. Because in fact, now when I'm confronted with crazy, I'm strong and I'm clear and I can have the hard conversations now. And when I get pushed back, I'm able to maintain myself and my boundaries in what my gut tells me is right. I am more honest and I'm less nice in the service of keeping a connection. My sister, she's one of the lucky ones because she went to therapy She's on her, she went to therapy, she's healed her trauma, she's on the right meds, she's living the happily ever after. The thing that I'm most grateful to Sue for, honestly, is the moments that my kids are in there crazy. When my son comes barreling out of his room, punching walls, and giving me every expletive known to man, screaming, my fucking mountain bike is broken. The brakes are broken. It costs $400 to fix it. It needs to be fixed now. I'm going biking with Parker this weekend in New Hampshire. Don't you get it? I'm calmer. <laughs> no shit. I'm calmer. Really. That's good. Good for and you. And I can stay in the conversation with him now. <laughs> It's amazing to me. And I'm able to say, no, that's not happening. Sue has helped me be the parent my kids need, not the parent they want. And it's amazing to me that my son now goes into his room for about 15 minutes. He comes out, no words, and he hugs me. And it's in those moments that I wonder if Sue has gotten as much out of her therapy as I have. Thank you.